in a bad view from up here. Certainly better than the views from the sorting office back home. Something to think of when we're stuck in the trenches. Yeah, got to keep a good head out there, otherwise you might lose it. Relax, little man, we're on the same side. Save that rage for the Germans. Hey, kid. Why did you sign up at your age? You should still be in school. School wasn't for me. I didn't get on with my teachers and I was always being disciplined. I just stopped going and started delivering telegrams from the front. So many mothers, wives, sisters, always crying. It just always seemed to be bad news. I just vowed to do my bit. So you went to the recruitment office and faked your age? Yeah. The sergeant knew I was too young, but he didn't care. They just need all the able-bodied men they can get. I just want to do my part and fight <laughs> for my king and country. <clears throat> At ease, boys. The military police would love to hear about you, my boy. One word from the sergeant you'll be done for. Little man wouldn't even make it to France in the end. I think on this occasion we can overlook it. What you did shows tremendous courage and patriotism. Right boys, back to work. This badge won't finish itself. And the boys in the 5th and 6th battalions aren't sitting around scratching their asses. Let's show them what the post office rifles can do. Sir. Sir. I don't know how you do it, Mary. In my eyes, your job is the hardest one in this war. It's tough at times, but there are definitely moments when you feel like you're making a difference. Well, why don't you come down to the camp tomorrow and I'll show you around? Oh, I don't know, Mary. I can't cope with blood and... <laughs> oh, Agnes, these boys haven't been to war yet. The worst you'll see here is cuts and bruises, or at worst, a broken bone. I have at least one in a day with an injury for them sliding down the hill on their shovel. Okay, I'll come and see, but... I think giving food and water to the men is the most help I can provide. Don't underestimate yourself, Agnes. We women have to keep this country going whilst our men are away. Mother and father would be very proud of you, Mary. I miss them very much. They'll be proud of us both. Look who's coming, it's Waltz girl and her nurse friend. Hey, look at that smile, that's love right there. Sod off, Howard. She's not my girl. But you like her, don't you? Cut it out. It's nothing to do with you. Hey kid, how many girlfriends have you had? I'll take that as none. Give him some slack. He's just a boy. It's character building, sir. He'll thank me. One day. Easy. That's got to go around the lads of the fifth and the sixth as well. Ooh, stop it, Eugene. <laughs> oh, careful you don't get any trouble from me. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> That looks good, sir. They all do. Do you reckon they'll still be here for a hundred years? Nah, they'll fade. They'll all be forgotten. I disagree. I think these badges will be here for many years to come. And in a hundred years, people will look on this hillside and they'll remember the brave men and women who fought for their country. In 1915, early 1915, Fovent was selected to be a camp for training the new army, what was called the new army. All those 
millions of volunteers that volunteered from 1914 onwards. Uh, so a large camp was built in the valley here, housing up to 20,000 soldiers. And they came over here to do their final training before they went to France to, to fight in the trenches. And then a little later on there was a hospital constructed and the wounded came back to Fovent as well. And in fact it was such an important um, camp that the railway line was built into Fovent from the main line and that connected both with the hospital and with the camp. And while the soldiers were here they built chalk features on the hillside which were their military insignia for their regiment. And the first one was built probably in April, May time, 1916, and that was the London Rifle Brigade. And quite soon afterwards, a number of other badges were on the hillside. And when we say badges, I mean, you're talking about up to 40 metres high. They are massive, and they have to be, to be viewed at any distance from the hillside. After a few years, there were anything up to almost 20 large uh, military badges and civilian badges, for example, there was a YMCA badge on the hillside because the YMCA were here caring for the soldiers while they were in the camp. Over the years, most of those have disappeared. Uh, and then in World War II, whilst the badges were all covered up so that uh, the Luftwaffe, the enemy aircraft, couldn't recognise the location, um, shortly afterwards, the Fovent Home Guard, bless them, uh, they built two new badges after World War II um, and so added to those World War I badges. And then in 1970, uh, the Royal Corps of Signals built a further badge. So up until this year, 2016, there were eight badges that range really from 1916 right the way through to 1970. So effectively, you know, those are badges right the way through the 20th century. So um, around about uh, 2012, 2013, we started to consider how we would mark the centenary of the Fovent badges in 2016. Uh, and at the same time, uh, lots of people were talking about the centenary of World War I. So I think we all recognised that that centenary was such a great opportunity for us to make our contribution, first of all, to the World War I centenary, but also to mark the centenary of the first badge being cut in 1916. You know, we considered a whole range of things. We considered doing nothing, which, which you know, was a non-starter, obviously. We considered restoring some badges, but we had a fear there that if we restored one more badge, apart from the high cost of maintenance that would entail, we'd probably get demands for further badges to be restored. So, in the end, we came up with the project to put a new chalk feature on the hillside to mark the centenary. Well, originally uh, I was appro approached by Richard, who's a friend of mine in the village, and he knew I was a designer. And he asked me to submit ideas for a badge to commemorate the 19... 16 erection of the first badge. Originally we started off with ideas about peace and what sort of image we should have on the, ba on the hillside which originally started out as sort of military badges with peace underneath and things like that. So the first ideas I got together had a badge, the dates and peace and so this first idea was put to the committee, which uh, was 
uh, talked about and so that people would get some idea of what they wanted. But the first idea was too complicated. So I went back to the drawing board again <laughs> and we thought that a dove was a good idea as a peace emblem. So I did lots of graphic designs of, of doves in different ways, how you could simplify a dove rather than just have a see, graphic picture. Somehow, I don't know why that wasn't quite accepted either. So then I put a poppy in the mouth of the dove as an extra. <laughs> and somehow the poppy became the feature rather than the dove. So after, you know, a lot of, you know, just trying to make a, a poppy that looked like a poppy, <laughs> but was only a, a sort of simple line. When we got the design on paper, we, we went and went marked on the hill the, where the centre would be. And with ropes and everything, we tried to work out where it was going to be like. Anyway, I had some white sheeting in the house and I was, I was just showing it out. And we thought, well, that's a good idea. We'll, we'll do a cutout of this version. So we had to search for some material that we could use to uh, use as a template on the hillside and we found some thin plastic sheeting which was and I and Richard cut out the the whole of the template using this grid format and then we had this wonderful time of trying to get it on the hill itself because <laughs> this thin plastic is quite it blew all over the place and so we we pinned it out onto the hillside everyone thought it was the from a distance, it looked as though it was the real thing, chalk. We ended up with thinking that, you know, the Flanders poppy was the most appropriate design we could use because it would appeal to the whole of the nation, really. Um, everybody could relate to that as uh, something that was how we all remembered the, the contribution of those World War I soldiers and indeed all other uh, British servicemen and women that had served since World War I. So every year the Fovent Badgers Society um, organises the drumhead service and this is always on the first Sunday in July and I think that's really because it's the closest Sunday to the first day of the Battle of the Somme. And these drumhead services um, are services of remembrance. They're attended by the Royal British Legion with all their standards. There's usually an army contingent and about three to four hundred members of the public, members of the Fovent Badger Society. Giver of joy in every generation, companion in sorrow, even when grief veils your presence. Accept our sorrow for those who fell in battle on the soul. This year, of course, was rather special because it was the anniversary, the centenary of the first badge being made in 1916. Our guest of honour was uh, the Earl of Wessex, um, and uh, he's our patron uh, and he came along to uh, give a talk and an address to the drumhead service so this year was a very special drumhead service. There can be no better or more fitting choice of symbol not only to replace the former YMCA badge but also to remember all those volunteers whether military or civilian here at Fodham. Volunteers today the military, represented by the Guidon of the Royal Military Yeomanry, and civilians by the Fovent Badges Society, continue to exhibit many of the same values and qualities and should be exceedingly proud of their heritage. Before we started to dig, English heritage had required us to ensure that there was absolutely no archaeology under where we were going to dig. The plan now is really to start uh, with the field work um, and the archaeology, so 
we're using different techniques in the field um, to investigate the badges and their immediate surroundings, um, starting with the geophysical survey in the area that they're going to be cutting the new badge. Um, so we're using three geophysical survey techniques here, um, really to be able to compare three different methods of locating things under the surface of the ground. Yesterday and the day before we were out doing earth resistance survey and this is where we use probes to pass an electrical current through the ground to measure the variations in the resistance to the current over an area. So what we're hoping to see there is where you have maybe colluvium that's washed into the cut of the badge. We may get the shape of the, of the badge showing as low resistance or we may find that the chalk rubble that's been dumped when they created the badge may give us a slightly higher resistance. So that's what we're trying to measure in terms of, of, the, of, of these features. Today with the ground penetrating radar, what this technique does is to pass a electromagnetic radio wave into the ground and measure the time it takes for that wave to be passed into the ground and to reflect off objects under the ground. So again here what we're hoping to see is some kind of difference between the natural and the infilling of the badge, whether occurring from when they cut the badge or where material is washed into the badge at a later date to see if we can see a contrast between those different materials and it may show the badge's location. Part of the health and safety uh, aspect of this project was to ensure that should we come across any World War I um, munitions of any kind whatsoever, we were well prepared. So the chances are that whatever they had to hand, potentially you can find out there. So we've tried to tailor this brief to the sort of things you're likely to find. There were all infantry regiments um, in the area. So we've got a selection of, of hand grenades, small uh, handheld explosive devices that they'd be thrown trench to trench, a couple of lighter mortar systems, and then just sort of curiosity, we have some artillery natures at the end. Um, so if we begin at the beginning, um, we'll start off with the number one. Very simple bit of kit. The idea was a small, simple explosive device with a, a shrapnel piece in the front. You would throw it over the, uh, the trench, land in the enemy's trench, uh, and hopefully um, upset them. With all artillery shells, they look vaguely the same. They all follow the same basic ballistic principles, which means an artillery shell, regardless of the job or the size, still has to get through the air to get there, so it's going to look roughly the same. To illustrate this, this is a 14 pound shot, so this is just a big lump of metal. This is completely safe. You can play with this all day long. The worst you can do is crush your foot when you drop it. This is a six pound high explosive. This is hollow but filled with high X. Um, that is rather less safe to play with. However, visually, given both 20 years in the ground, they'll look the same. Again, I say that just to stress the point I made earlier, always go worst case scenario. To start the whole process off, of digging the badge, Richard Bullard dug the first turf. Uh, and we went on from there uh, and discovered how really hard it was to just take off the turfs from the top of the, uh, uh, the ground. This was why we were using mattocks uh, in order to make life a little easier, but it was still pretty hard. The first time we brought chalk in, we created a chain gang down the hillside from the chalk pile at the top of the hill using buckets. We decided that this wasn't the best way of getting the chalk down the hillside, so we employed a different method uh, whereby we filled or part filled sacks uh, with chalk and started the process of dragging them down the hillside. The idea was to fill up the trench to 150 millimetres, around six inches, as is done in all the other badges. On the second day of the dig, the Royal Signals sent a contingent of four strapping lads along um, who dug the centre of the poppy. Uh, it took them about two and a half hours to dig the centre, fill it with chalk um, and um, complete the job. My name is John Leach and I'm the Chief Executive for Team Rubicon. So I'm responsible for putting the team together uh, recruiting the staff we now have and overseeing training and operations. So we're based in Chilmark, just west of Salisbury, so only a short drive from the badges. So we're aware of them and their you know, poignant military history. And we heard about what was being done and we heard that they were looking for volunteers. So we were in a great position to bring people out here and do some hands-on help, which is what we do. We want to get stuck in, help people that need it. And these are good skills, these are good 
team leadership skills, the good hands-on hard work, and again, adds to that sense of purpose that we look for. People should take an interest in what they are and the history of the badges. And you know, secondly, come and have a look, you know, see what, what has been done here. You know, the history, the soldiers who were based here originally and uh, started putting these badges together, but then the history since and the people that have put time into maintaining them and restoring them and the latest project um, for, the, for the centenary and the, and the badge that we're helping with today. And it's great, it's great to be part of this. And I think I would encourage people to come and volunteer just to do their small bit. You know, you don't have to spend a whole day, spend a few hours just doing your little bit just to add to the, to the badge itself. We do a lot of walking in the area. Um, and while out walking, we, a few years ago now, we saw um, a gentleman clearing the badges and we stopped our walk and helped him. We, we weeded and we carried bags down and, um, and from him we learned all about the badges. We hadn't heard anything about them, we didn't know anything about them um, before that, but we, we learned quite a bit about them. Um, and then last year Richard Bullard came and gave a talk in Stratford Subcastle about the badges and said that they were um, building this new centenary badge um, and that they were looking for volunteers. General Sir Nick Parker is, is very he heavily involved in the badge project and he's also uh, the chair of tr trustees of Team Rubicon UK uh, and he happened to mention to myself and a colleague that it was the drumhead service uh, a, a week or so ago. Uh, so Sarah and I came to the service and, and then realised that actually we had a fantastic opportunity um, just to be, to be part of a really, really lovely piece of military and particularly veteran history. Well basically we've been turf stripping um, we, the volunteers from the Fovent Badges Association have laid out a template of white plastic uh, over where the uh, new poppy is going to be and the students have been helping with turf stripping, moving the turfs down slope and also packing in um, chalk rubble that's been brought in from a quarry uh, near Basingstoke. So we're, we're moving all the chalk down the hill and then packing it in the trenches that we're making by taking the turf out. The ground's quite, uh, well it's stony, it's chalky, um, it's hard because it's summer um, and, and there's lots of roots. So in some places where we've gone into, um, into brambles and so on, the roots are really difficult to get out. So we've got mattocks and we've got shovels. Um, just ploughing on through but it's good it's satisfying work. The main job we've been doing is uh, ferrying chalk up and down the hill or down mostly and then uh, carrying the bags up and it is very steep and you certainly feel it as you get into the top of the hill. Friday I found um, a bullet a small 303 bullet um, so the firing range is way down there um, so we're not quite sure how I think now four bullets have been found up here and we're not quite sure how they got up here whether they were shooting it rabbits or just misfiring, don't know. These badges on the on the hill have been here for a hundred years and so almost to be part of a project that will be has the potential to be here for another hundred years is is very like rewarding in a way. It, you're basically making archaeology so it's it's lasting for people so it's it's a good thing to be part of I think. It's amazing what the guys in 1916 did um, and the fact that they're their work has lasted a hundred years. Um, with, with volunteers, the Foven Badge Society uh, have, have cleared, um, they, they come up here, I'm not sure how often they, they come up here, but they weed them and they sometimes put fresh chalk and so on. Um, so it's, it's a good thing to be carrying on their work. It's, it's a memory of, of the, the, the guys that were here fighting for us. Um, and it's nice to carry on their work and, and follow it through and add to it. There's a legacy here which is it's not just about us in the UK and people seeing it as they drive past. It's about us protecting something um, you know, that's been evolved from, from people who've come from all around the world, people who've travelled halfway around the world to fight alongside you know, our relatives here. And I think creating and preserving a legacy for them just as much for us is a really important thing. Um, it is a huge part of our culture um, you know, and has shaped generations uh, and, and the more people can get involved with that the more they'll feel ownership for it and, and feel passion for it.
We felt it was really important that we commemorate this, this centenary with something that is relevant and pertinent and what could be better than carving a poppy with 1916 and 2016 on it, uh, commemorating sacrifice and commemorating the amazing work of the British Legion. And the third point to make is that the people who carved this out, volunteers and people from the military, all really committed themselves to bringing their children and their grandchildren here to, to make them understand the relevance of their history. Our mission is twofold. It is to maintain the badges, to keep them in the excellent condition they're in, and secondly, it's to educate the public. So we linked those two things together in what we called our centenary project. This was not, though, going to be just about building the badge. The whole purpose of building this centenary badge was to involve as many people in the badges story as possible. These badges, all of them, are not going to survive long into the 21st century unless we involve as many people as possible. People much younger than me so that they can take up the responsibility of maintaining these badges after I'm gone. If you look at the history of the badges in the 20th century, I mentioned earlier that there were 20 originally and only five survive in world, you know, from World War I. So over that century, people have had a different attitude to the badges. Sometimes they were very supportive and sometimes they were not. And that's why the badges have disappeared over that century. And there's no guarantee that that won't happen again in the future. So that was another under, underpinning reason for wanting to build this new badge for the 21st century. Thank you.